Greetings to all of you. I'm Pastor Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's great to be with you today as we enter into another session on the book of Revelation. This is session number eight. It's a pleasure to be part of your journey and your education and your Bible study time. I certainly would encourage you and welcome you if this is your first session, but certainly to go back and take a look at the previous sessions as we are building and walking through the book of Revelation. Uh, we are building week after week on different ideas. So it certainly would be important and beneficial for you to take the opportunity to go back and look at the, the previous sessions to see what, uh, what we've talked about. Um, in apocalyptic literature, uh, there's a lot of recapitulation and building and we're seeing that around the numerology, around the symbolism, and I talked a lot about that in the first session to try to lay out a, a groundwork, a basis, if you will, as we move forward. We're going to see some of that today. So if some of it doesn't make sense or if some of it is unclear, I, I hope that uh, previous sessions would help to clear that up. So once again, it's great to have you with us. Uh, we're going to be walking through the book of Revelation. We're going to be doing chapter four today. Uh, as far as we can get through chapter four, that is anyway. So I would encourage you to have a Bible before you. Uh, you can either have a paper book before you. Um, I, I use the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but you can use any translation or transliteration, any language that you want to work with. That's all well and good. Um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but this is a way so you can engage the word if you want to do it digitally. Uh, BibleGateway.com is a great resource. It has a lot of different translations and paraphrases. You can pick just about anything that you want. Uh, so that would certainly be an option as well. But whatever you choose to do, I certainly would encourage you to engage the Bible, to have the Bible in front of you. One of the things about Bible study is that we learn this text, this book, this 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 this. Um, this thing that we can engage and use. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of history about people memorizing the Bible. I'm not much of a memorizer because memorization is really just kind of take it in, spit it out, and use it when you need it, then forget it. But if you learn how to use the Bible, if you learn how to navigate the Bible, then you're never without uh, access to it. So one of the things that we do in Bible study is we actually engage the scripture. Um, we engage the story. So we're in Revelation. Now, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It's the last book of the New Testament. Obviously, the Bible's divided up in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the story of God's work through the nation of Israel. The New Testament is the story of God's work through Jesus Christ and the ensuing uh, beginning of the church. Sorry about that. Excuse me. So... Here we are, Revelation chapter 4, we're going to begin with verse 1. Now, keep in mind, this is John, the Apostle John, the youngest of the Apostles, the one whom Jesus loved. He's on the island of Patmos, and we just got through the angel, the, 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 we just got through the Savior, the Messiah, the risen Christ, speaking to the angel of the churches, the seven churches. So, so all that the angel has said in chapter 2 and 3, all that, the, angel, all that the, the Savior has said to the angels, he's saying to the whole church, to the church universal. The number seven is a universal number. So these prescripts and these things that took place in these seven churches, they're for the church universal. They are for us even still today to address, deal with, and make sure that we combat against as we live out our faith. So, chapter 4. After this, I looked, and there in heaven a door stood open. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Okay, so, um, after John has experienced these messages to the seven churches, he says, I looked up. Now, this is John speaking in the first person. After this, after the, the speaking of the, to the seven angels of the seven churches, after laying out all the issues that were going on in the church, John says, I looked up and there in heaven a door stood open. So for John, for this moment, this is a, a cracking open of the void, the chasm between earth and heaven. 
Now, what's, what's the significance of this? The significance of this is this. God resides in heaven. Okay, that's, God, that's where God's throne is. It, it says, the scriptures say that, that, that God is in heaven and earth is his footstool. So God resides in heaven. So heaven is this place of perfection and purity where God resides. And we as beings, we as broken, sinful beings, nothing sinful can come into the presence of God. So the fact that the door of heaven is open and that a human has access to it, this is very profound. This is God opening up access so that somebody here can see what's going on there. And then come back and tell about it. And look, if we don't know what's there, why would we want to go? And so we need a glimpse. And so John is given the glimpse of what's going on in heaven. So he sees the door open and he says, And I heard the voice who spoke to me, the first voice. That would be the voice of the risen Savior. That would be the voice of Jesus, the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord and Savior, seated at the right hand of God, the one who intercedes on our behalf. So Jesus, the ascended Lord, is the mouthpiece. He is the speaker. So he is carrying on this role that he had on earth of teaching the word, but now he is speaking prophetically. Now he is speaking as the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord. So John makes it very clear. This isn't a voice of an angel. This isn't a voice of a messenger. This is the voice of Jesus. And it sounded like a trumpet. Come up here, and I will show you what may, must take place after this. So the Savior is inviting John into the courts of heaven for a glimpse. The Savior is inviting John into the courts of heaven to see what comes next, to see what comes after this. Now, John's role will be to see this, to experience it, to witness it, then come back and share it. Again, the reason why we get the sharing is so that we know what's going to happen. So that we know what we're striving for, this life of faith, this struggle, this discipline. Why would we do it? Well, if we know what we're striving for, if we know the carrot at the end of the stick, if you will, then we keep marching along trying to get it. This is verse 2. At once, at once, I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on it. And the one seated on the throne looked like jasper and carnally. And around the throne is a rainbow that looked like an emerald. Around the throne are 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their head. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. So John says at once I was in the spirit. Now, here's the thing. Here's where one of the big questions about the book of Revelation comes in. John is on Patmos. And that's where his body is. That's where his life is. And now when the, when, when the Savior calls him up, the inclination, the interpretation we get is that it was a spiritual lifting, not a physical one. That John had a, what we would call sort of an out-of-body experience. Where John's spirit is lifted up in heaven. And, how, and, and this is profound because remember what I said. Nothing sinful comes into the presence of God. In order to enter into the gates of heaven, we have to die and be reborn. Pure, perfect, sinless. That's the whole death and resurrection thing. So John in the spirit. So the inclination we get is that John is lifted up in the spirit, that his, his inner being, and, and, and 
there's really no adequate word. Spirit, soul, breath, life force. Eh, there's really no adequate there's really no adequate word because we don't necessarily believe or feel that there's a separation between the physical and the spiritual. We're one in the same. Can't live one with the other. Can't live one without the other. Uh, but this is God we're talking about here. So God, you know, nothing with God is impossible. Um, and we see something very similar to this way back in the book of Acts with Peter. When Peter is up on the, on the rooftop praying, and he goes into what he calls a trance or a prayerful state when he's lifted up, when, when, when he sees the sheets coming down with all of the clean and unclean animals on them. So it's something very similar to that. John is in this, this state where he is lifted up into heaven and immediately he stood in a throne room um, with one seated on the throne. Okay. Now this vision, this is the vision of heaven. This grand opulent throne room, this grand opulent place where the ruler resides. Now this harkens very much back to um, ancient of days, rulers, Pharaoh, the rulers in China and the Eastern empires, they had these incredible opulent throne rooms with things like emerald and gold and jasper and Carnelane, these beautiful, um, incredible stones and gems and jewels. So it's fitting that for the vision, God would be seated in a throne room more glorious than anything else. Now I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Most rulers did this kind of stuff to show power, okay? Throne rooms were opulent. Thrones were big. It's a sign of power. It is meant to be that when you walked into a throne room or into a ruler's uh, presence, you were in awe by what surrounded them. It made the ruler look bigger, more powerful, more opulent. Do we need that with God? No, we don't. We don't need that with God. God doesn't need a throne room to be opulent and powerful and to look majestic. This is God we're talking about here. So why the throne room? Why this vision? Well, it's pretty important to understand that, that in the midst of where John is at, John is in exile under a Roman emperor. A Roman emperor has this opulent throne room. There are people coming from different parts of the world, Africa and Egypt and Far East coming in telling stories of this throne room. So if John goes to heaven and he stands before God, and God's seated on a wooden chair, or God's sitting on a prayer rug, or God's standing in a lake of heaven feeding ducks, and John comes back and talks about that, then the people are going to be like, well, wait a minute, this is God, but God's throne room doesn't sound anything like Pharaoh's or the Roman emperor's. They must be better. It's not that God needs to compete. God doesn't need to compete. But our brains, our heads, our imagination can be so small. And our expectation and understanding of power. So for John, he needs to see God in this massive throne room. He needs to see this display of power. So that he can relate to the people this display of power and they can say, they can feel, they can internalize that their God sits in a throne room bigger than any other throne room that was ever built. Because their God is bigger than anything else. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need that in our, in our being. So that's what we get in this throne room. It's massive. It's a massive throne room and there's one seated in the center. There's one seated in the center. And who is that one seated in the center? It's God. It is the creator, the father. It is the one to whom all things extend. And we know that. We see that. The throne, you know, the one seated on the throne looked like Jasper and Carnley. And around the throne is a rainbow that looked like an emerald. Around the throne are 24 thrones. And seated on those are the 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their head. 
So what does this mean? So we have one throne in the middle and 24 thrones around it, 12 on each side. Okay? Uh, when we start to think about the, the symbolism of it, when we start to think through what it looks like, we have the 12 tribes of Israel and we have the 12 disciples. So 24 is a big number. It's a complete number. But it also represents the 12 tribes and the 12 disciples. So who are the 24 elders around the throne? The represent representation of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Mirrors, as they were in the scriptures. Again, and here's John, he's looking at these, he's going, yeah, this, okay, all of this symbolism, all this is coming in, all of this makes sense. And we do this, we do this all the time. That's how symbolism works. I mean, let, let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about this for a minute. You know, if, if I say I'm going to take you to a football game and we show up at an opera house. Now, even if there's a football game that's being played on the stage, none of the other symbolism makes sense. You're inside and, you know, there's a piano or an organ and a stage and you're sitting in an amphitheater. None of that symbolism makes sense. So there's this struggle to figure out exactly what's going on. But if you go to a stadium with stadium seating and billboards and a jumbotron and you smell popcorn and, and you hear the cheering, all that symbolism comes around it. For John, who probably was massively overwhelmed being in the throne room of God, the 24 elders around the throne made sense. This is also a connection. There was a lot of debate about whether the people of Israel were part of the covenant of God. Well, here John is standing in the throne room and the 12 tribes of Israel are on one side and the 12 apostles are on the other. This unification of the Old and the New Testament, this unification of the Old and the New Covenant, that God's people are all together and represented and they're pure. Talks about white robes, Again, white is the color of purity, golden crowns on their heads. You know, white robes, when someone is given a white robe, it's a garment, it's an overgarment or a new garment. It's a garment of purity. It's very hard to keep something white, even in today's world. You wear a white shirt and inevitably within the first hour you're going to have a coffee stain or, you know, you're going to get pasta sauce on it or something, maybe an ink stain. Very hard to keep something white and we have permapress and, and, and you know, mixed linens and, and washing machines. White is the color of purity. And so the elders get a white robe, an overgarment, a new garment. Very symbolic, reminiscent of... Um, you know, we see white robes in baptism. Candidates in baptism often wear a white robe or a white baptismal dress. They're being purified, raised, made new. That's what baptism is. So again, here's this imagery, this symbolism. These people sitting around the throne are pure. And the gold crown on their head means they're rulers. It means that they have the ear of the one sitting on the throne. Which is really incredible because God, the maker of heaven and earth, actually pays attention and listens to what those seated on the throne may say. I'm not going to say it's a democracy because it's not a democracy. God's in charge. But God takes counsel. God takes counsel from the 24 sitting on, around him on the throne. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, so uh, thunder and lightning, this is the representation of God, the Almighty. We go to Greek and Roman and um, even back into the Old Testament. Think about Moses when he's up on Mount Sinai. What do the people see? Thunder, lightning. God's represented as thunder and lightning. When thunder and lightning roll out, that was God coming into the world. Especially when God was said he was going to be there, like with Moses. Elijah experiences thunder and lightning. So, so this is all imagery. It's all very clear. This is God. John is standing in the throne room of God. So whatever John sees, whatever he witnesses or experiences, needs to be told. 
because this is God opening up the window and showing what's going to happen. So whatever is seen needs to be told because God is telling John this. Very important, very important, very important. And there are seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God in front of the throne. And in front of the throne, there's something like a sea of glass, like crystal. So, so in front of the throne, okay, a couple of things. The seven torches, the seven spirits of God, this harkens back to the seven churches, to the seven lights, the seven lampstands, the golden lampstands. Okay, so we're seeing this. So, so the messengers, the church stands in the throne room of God. The spirit of God, the spirit of the churches is in the throne room as well as sent out into the world. So I, w I, want you to, I, I want you to take an image of this for a minute. Now, you know, in the local congregation, in the local church, here we are in a local church, we're in Alliance, and, you know, there's many churches around us, and there's many churches throughout the United States, you know. So, so that there's always the inevitable question, you know, are we just kind of deployed in God's name and God's not paying attention? Are we doing our thing and as long as we don't anger God or turn away from God, God's just like, hey, yeah, go do your thing. It's all good. It's all good. You know, like sending a kid out to play. I don't want to know what you're doing unless you get hurt or wander too far. But what this vision is saying is no. The church is not some deployed entity that God doesn't pay attention to. The church resides in God's throne room. The essence of the church resides in God's throne. That's how close we are to the divine. That's how closely the divine pays attention to us because we are the ones that bear the spirit of God. So what we do, who we are, is very close to God. God pays attention. God does care. God is showing importance. And God is showing that the church is important. God does care. That's a, really that's a really necessary thing to embrace. We're not just doing things here hoping that, that God may or may not be pleased, that God may or may not pay attention. We are doing things knowing that God is intimately involved. That the spirit that rests upon us is the same spirit that resides in the throne room. It's that spirit that John is talking about here. And in front of the throne, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. A reflection pool. Can't get close to the, the throne. I mean, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of that pool out there. Is that you can't get close to the throne. If you're approaching the throne, you're way out there on the other side of the pool. Because if you try to traverse the pool and you make it through the pool, you're going to get taken out before you get to the throne. This is a protective measure, but it's also a show of power. I mean, who builds a building? with a throne room with a pool in it, a big pool. This is, a, this is an expanse. This is a statement of power. This is meant to show awe and wonder. But it's that same God who sits on that throne of awe and wonder who sent the Son to be born into time in Bethlehem. So we see this statement of opulence and grace and power, awesomeness. That's the vision we're to get. So when John is standing in the throne room and telling us this, we're supposed to be going, wow, yeah, that's intense. That's awesome. This God deserves to be praised. This God deserves to be praised. Around the throne, this is now, um, I'm in the middle of verse 6. Around the throne, and on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings, are flying, full of eyes all around, inside and out. Day and night, without ceasing, they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
So these are, these are the guardians. All right? These are the guardians of the throne. So they're around the throne. On each side of the throne. Their job is to make sure that no portion of the throne is ever unseen. So that there's always eyes on a 360 degree around the throne. At no point could anyone ever approach the throne without one of the four living creatures seeing it. At no point, there is no blind spot, weak spot in the throne. And anybody who goes to any kind of leadership, especially you know, world leadership, governmental leadership, blind spots are a problem. Blind spots are where um, bad people do bad things. So for God, there is no blind spot. These four living creatures, and each one of these four living creatures have four heads, four faces. And they have eyes, full of eyes, front and back. So these four living creatures, and, and, and here's the thing, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going I'm to pull this out just a little bit because I want you to see this. I'm going to pull this out just a little bit. So in the throne room, there's four living creatures, lion, ox, human, and uh, flying eagle. Now, from the gospel standpoint, each one of the four gospels in the scriptures are assigned one of those four creatures. Matthew is the Matthew is the um, is the lion. Luke is the ox. Mark is the human, and John is the eagle. Um, and maybe you've actually might have been in a church. Um, this is, I think, kind of more um, East Coast. Uh, maybe German influence where the lectern is actually carved like an eagle where they read from the Bible it's like an eagle because that represents um, the gospel of John that is the that is the figure the figurehead of the gospel of John okay so four living creatures so these living creatures encompass everything humans and all of creation are present in the throne room so humans and all of creation, all living creatures are present in the throne room and they are represented by giving a 360 degree protection of the throne. That's what we see. They're flying around. They've got six wings, three sets of wings, which means that they can fly just pretty much um, forever. Uh, they can sit, they can fly, very versatile. Nothing is going to go unseen. But I'm going to stretch this out a little bit because, you know, and, and we think well, that's pretty far out. That's pretty far-fetched. But just to, I want you to think about how many eyes God has seeing the world today. I mean, if we extrapolate that out and we think and we, and we understand that every set of eyes, my eyes, your eyes, we are called to defend the throne of God. And for us, the throne of God is the church, the word. We are called to watch for those who would tear the throne down. We are called to watch for those who would go after the throne. We are the ones to make sure that God has no blind spot in the world. Our eyes. Now, can we fly? No. Do we have a head full of eyes? No. But communally, we have all of these eyes to see. So we still protect the throne. We are the creatures in this world. We are the ones in this world called to protect the throne of God and make sure that the throne of God isn't brought into ruin or despair. So they're flying around day and night and they're singing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is the song of praise. So holy, 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 the Sanctus. We sing this. I mean, we take this text right out of it and we use it in our worship service. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Right after, right after the, um, the uh, Great Thanksgiving, right before communion, um, we sing the Holy, Holy, Holy. It's called the Sanctus. That's what, that's what the word um, Sanctus means, is holy. And notice it. It's extended out. It's not just holy, but holy, holy, holy. That repetition means that it is important. It is set aside. So it goes on into eternity. It's not just once, but it's repeated. 
So when you repeat something three times, then you're extending it out to ultimate. And we'll see that later when we get to the, the, the number of, of the beast, the number of evil. So when you extend something out three times, you're, getting, you're extending it to the ultimate. So the ultimate in holy. This is the ultimate in holy. And holy means set apart, sanctified. So this is the ultimate in set apart and sanctified. The Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Perfection, completion, unity. Um, this is the praise of God. God has no beginning and no end. We think linearly. Point A to point B to point C to point D. Start to finish all the things in between. God doesn't think linearly. God doesn't exist linearly. God doesn't have a start and God doesn't have an end. A circular, no beginning, no end. Who was and is and is to come. So this is the, this is the, um, this is the vision. This is what John is seeing in the throne room. It's opulence, the creatures, the protectors, always unceasing, making sure that the throne is protected 360, 24-7. So nothing could ever get to the throne without one of the four living creatures seeing it. Nothing could ever get to God without some kind of notice beforehand. Which for a ruler, that's ultimate. Because the ruler never has to worry about their protection. That's taken care of by another and whenever, and this is verse 9, and whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. Okay, so this vision, as the, as the four living creatures are singing holy, 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 when this happens, when the praise and the shouts and the joy, then the 24 living, the 24 elders, they fall before the throne. They cast their crowns on the throne. So they, they're giving over not only worship and opulence, they're, they're giving over supplication. Falling down on your knees before a leader is supplication. That's why we kneel when we pray. You know, kneeling is a statement of servitude. Servitude. We can't defend ourselves when we kneel. So when we're kneeling, we're putting our trust in the one we're kneeling before. That's the posture of kneeling. Particularly if we kneel and bow our heads and we're exposing our neck. Okay? Um, so the elders fall before the throne. And they worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. So the four living creatures are giving statement to the fact that this is the one who created all things. This is God. Now John is being given a glimpse of this. John is being given a glimpse of this so that when he writes this down, when he starts to talk about it and share it, and someone comes along and says, well, why should we listen to you? This sounds like a bunch of, you know, hooey. Well, because this is what I saw, and this is the throne room. And this comes directly from God. There's no mistake about that. That's why John is being given this glimpse. And that's why John shares this glimpse with us. So that what is to come, so that what God is expecting John to do, what God is expecting the church to do, what God is expecting us to do, we can do knowing it's coming from God. Even if we may not want to do it. Even if it's hard. We can do it because God is asking us to do it. God is expecting us to do it. God is laying it forth for us to do it. For God truly is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For God did create all things. And by his will they exist and were created. So again, this harkens all the way back to Genesis. 
This kind of ties it all up to say, look, the one who created all things, they exist because you wanted them to exist. You are worthy for that praise and glory and honor because you wanted them to exist. See how that all comes together? Ties up. So John would know the stories of creation. John would know the stories of Genesis. And anybody who would read it should know the stories and say, yeah, this is the story of creation. This is the one who is and was and is to come. This is the one who was there at the beginning, before when the earth was formless and void. Way back in the beginning of Genesis, now at the end with Revelation, it all comes back together. One long narrative with the Son of God coming down and being part of it. We need to see the connection with all of this. We need to see that the end of the story connects to the beginning, because if it doesn't, then we miss something somewhere. Or there's, not, there's no reason to have, to have the worthiness of praise. But the narrative goes from beginning to end. The whole of creating salvific narrative runs from when the earth is formless and void all the way up to and beyond John standing in the throne room. Because whatever John experiences and shares comes from the one who was there at creation comes from the one who ex exiled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Comes from the one who called Abraham and Sarah. Comes from the one who put Jonah in the belly of the fish. Comes from the one who parted the Red Sea. Comes from the one who sent his son to die for us. That is what we need to see. So that as we move forward into this text, as we move forward in this life of faith, we know that no matter how difficult it may be, we're being asked to do it by the one who was there from the beginning. That's the power of it. Thank you, my friends. Uh, as this video concludes, uh, my contact information will be up, my email and my Facebook page, as well as the website. If you have any questions or comments you would like, to, um, you would like me to talk about anything, please feel free to reach out and let me know. Please feel free to contact me so that... Um, so that I can try to incorporate if there was anything I was unclear about or didn't touch on enough. I would be happy to go ahead and explain more about that. Please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, one of the struggles, I love doing this, but one of the struggles is I can't see your faces. Uh, when, I, when I'm in Bible study, I like to make sure that everybody's on board, and if there's a question, I like to answer it uh, right away. Obviously, that's not possible, but uh, we can communicate in dialogue. So if you have any questions or comments or what have you, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll do the best I can to uh, answer them, overcome them, and help us to continue to be clear. Peace be with you all. I pray you have a great day, a wonderful week. Feel free to share this. Uh, feel free to share this study. I'm not holding anything back. I'm not trying to be private about it. So if you know someone who's struggling, if you know someone who's wandering, feel free to share it. Watch it together. Um, Get the word out there. That's how we grow. That's how we do what we do, by sharing what we believe and getting our word out there. Because there are others that are getting their word out there. And it may not be the word that people need to hear. So feel free to share it. Feel free to uh, repost it. Feel free to comment about it. Um, and any way I can help out, I'm here to do that. God bless you all. Have a great day.